Let me do a quick review, if I can, of the two previous sermons, the two weeks before. Remember, I showed you this slide. And if you look at it carefully, these are the list of the kings of Judah. Can you hear me? Mo, you can hear me? Okay. (laughs) Except for David, or Saul, David, and Solomon. They're not on there. You've seen this before. It's an incredible list. If you look closely, the good kings are in the dark color, or in the dark shade, and the bad are in the light shade, and in and the medium shade is mixed. How many good do you see there? I thought there were five. No, there's four. Four kings. And one of them was Hezekiah. And so we looked at what made Hezekiah different, and we discovered one verse. It says this about King Hezekiah and 2 Kings. And it doesn't say it about any... It does, David, it doesn't say David. It doesn't say it about Asa. It doesn't say about Jehoshaphat. It doesn't say about Josiah. What it does say about Hezekiah, for he clung and held fast to the Lord and ceased not to follow him. That is the text of distinction to the one of the four who were good out of 22. And so the title of the sermon, It's Time to Cling On. We must be clinging to the Lord now, folks. There's no more time to play. And then the next verse, oh, by the way, the definition there of cling, uh, the Amplified says, for he clung or held fast to the Lord and ceased not to follow him. And then the second sermon, which was a week ago, we discovered that in the time of grave national crisis, what saved Hezekiah in Jerusalem was that they knew prophecy. And the question was, do we know prophecy? And so when King uh, Neb- uh, Shennacherib of Assyria came against Judah and besieged it, and they were the most mean, nasty, crummy, no good, low-down army that existed at that time, even the Egyptians couldn't defeat Assyria, he spread out the case before the Lord, he prayed in the temple, and then the next day, <laughs> the next day, an angel of the Lord comes, And he slew 185,000 Assyrian soldiers attacking the city of Jerusalem. So we learn we got to know prophecy. If we're going to be ready for what's coming, and by the way, I think it's already here, then we must be clinging to God right now and not to these lives of ours not to our cars, our houses, our finances, our jobs. I mean, yes, cling to those things, you got them, but start figuring out how to now use them and transfer them over to God because I'm telling you, very shortly, it's all going to be useless. I, I always tell my wife something and she jokingly always throws it back at me. I said, Jenny, that's going to burn pretty soon. But I never got to thinking until recently that before it burns, it's going to be worthless. Your house, worthless. Your bank account, go to move to Greece and find out what it's like to go to the ATM and, and be told you can only get $70 out a day. Places that doesn't have food, places that doesn't have water, uh, ISIS, By the way, don't go to the strip tonight, folks. Stay away. Not that I would go anyway. I wouldn't go anyway. But if you're into that, I want to be where the people are. I want to tell you, it's going to some place is going to be hit. There's no sense in taking a chance. 
And why, why end your life now in a stupid incident when God has something super planned to use us to help other people know Jesus? So we're not going anywhere tonight. And then we're going to look at today, the last one before I start my series next week. The title is The Leader of the People. Would you bow your heads with me as we pray? Father, I want to thank you for our baptismal candidates who are now members of our church for their boldness, Lord, in accepting you and publicly displaying their love of you and not being fearful, timid, or shy. And now, Lord, I pray that you help me be icing on the cake. For our Sabbath school, our church, to this point has been cake. Now, let this be the icing, Lord. Let me get out of the way so Jesus can be heard and seen. Bring these these cogent thoughts, Lord, powerfully to our minds that when we leave we'll be different from when we came and it'll be positive and not negative. And Lord, my special request, don't let anyone here be discouraged. But may they clearly see that you're with us till the end and you're the only one that we can count on. Therefore, we cling to you. So use me now in spite of me, in Jesus' name, amen. So I invite you to take your Bibles, if you would, and turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 20, and we're going to look at first, we're going to look at the whole chapter, actually, and let me show you what became of this Hezekiah. You know, you, you that have been here for three straight weeks, you know that we talked, it, the Bible clearly stated that Hezekiah, there wasn't a king before him or after him, the Bible said. Remember that quote? Let me show you what happened to King Hezekiah, who the Bible said there wasn't a king before him or after him, like him. In those days, Hezekiah was sick and near death, And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, went to him and said to him, Thus saith the Lord, set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. And then Hezekiah turned his face towards the wall, and he prayed to God, saying, Remember now, O Lord, I pray, how I have walked before you, and in truth, with a loyal heart, and have done what was good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. And it happened before Isaiah had gone into the middle of the court that the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Return and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people. Thus saith the Lord, the God of David, your father, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears, and surely I will heal you. On the third day you shall go up to the house of the Lord, and I will deliver you and this city. Wait, and I will add to your days 15 years, and I will deliver you and this city from the hands of the king of Assyria, and I will defend the city for my own sake, for the sake of my servant, David. And then Isaiah said, take a lump of figs. And so they took a lump and laid it on the boil, and he recovered. And then verse 7 through 11. 8 through 11. And then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, What is the sign that the Lord will heal me and that I shall go up to the house of the Lord on the third day? And then Isaiah said, This is the sign to you from the Lord that the Lord will do the thing which you have spoken, which he has spoken. Shall the saddle go forward 10 degrees or go backward 10 degrees? And Hezekiah answered, it is an easy thing for the shadow to go back down 10 degrees. 
No, but let the shadow go backward 10 degrees. So Isaiah the prophet cried out to the Lord, and he brought the shadow 10 degrees backward by which it had gone down on the sundial of Ahaz. Okay, you with me? Okay, hang in there now. Hang in there. Now let's take a look at uh, continuing chapter 20, and now let's skip to verse 12. Notice this. At that time, Baradak Baladan, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he heard that Hezekiah had been sick. And Hezekiah was attentive to them and showed them all the house of his treasure, the silver, the gold, the spices, and the precious ointment, and all his armor, all that was found among his treasures. There was nothing in his house or in all his dominion that Hezekiah did not show them. So Hezekiah, So Isaiah, the prophet, went to King Hezekiah and said to him, "Uh, what did these men say and from where did they come to you? So Hezekiah said they came from the far country of Babylon and he said, what have they seen in your house? So Hezekiah answered, They have seen all that is in my house. There is nothing among my treasures that I have not shown them. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and that your fathers have accumulated until this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord and they shall take away some of your sons who will descend from you and whom you begot, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. He did a no-no, folks. And I want you to know plainly in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, Prophets and Kings, chapter on Hezekiah. He brought the wealth of Israel back to the same level when David was king. He had many riches. And when these appointed messengers from the king of Babylon came, he showed them all his goodies. Now, what does this have to do with us today? What does this have to do with us in these last days that we're living? Well, now I want you to take a look at 2 Chronicles 32, 31. Okay, go in there. Go in your Bibles. Turn with me if you would. Or whatever you're using to look up the Scriptures. But look up the Scriptures. Let me show you this text. Now, here's the amazing thing. This is one of the most unusual stories in the Bible Why do I say that? I'll tell you why. Because no other story that I know of that a king experienced in the Bible is not only found in 1st or 2nd Kings, not only found in 1st or 2nd Chronicles, but this story is also found in Isaiah. Three places this story is told because it has deep significance for you and I. And I want to show you what this king that was extolled by God and privileged to be granted 15 more years and to rise the height of power and glory that he did because of his faithfulness to God. I want you to see what Isaiah said to him in verse 31 of chapter 32. However, regarding the ambassadors of the prince of Babylon, the princes of Babylon, whom they sent to Hezekiah to inquire about the wonders that was done in the land. I looked at this, 
And I went, wait a minute. However, regarding the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon, whom they sent to him to inquire about the wonder, the wonder that was done in the land. What is that wonder? Did you ever notice this? See, this isn't in 2 Kings. This isn't in Isaiah. The stories are, but this text is in Chronicles. For you see the king of Babylon and his princes were astrologers. They caught sight of the fact that the sundial moved back 10 degrees and they were so astounded, they discovered it had to do with Hezekiah, and he sent messengers to Hezekiah to learn about this wonder. Not about the gold and silver and trinkets and finery and possessions of the king. And here was Hezekiah's chance to tell them about his God in heaven, which can turn back the clock 10 degrees. And instead, he showed him all, them all his riches and never talked about God. And Isaiah came and said, Hezekiah, what is the matter with you? Look what it says. However, regarding the ambassadors of the prince of Babylon, whom they sent to him to inquire about the wonder that was done in the land, God withdrew from him in order to do what? Test him that he might know all that was in his heart. It was a test. And how did Hezekiah do the test? He flunked. He flunked the test. And so from this I have four points. Number one, we're all going to be tested, folks. We're all going to be tested. Every single one of you here is going to be tested. Are you ready for that test? I want you to know in his opulence and in, in his materialism, Hezekiah thought he was ready, but when the messengers came, instead of talking about God, he talked about his wealth. We're all going to be tested. Turn to Deuteronomy, and we're, we're going to come back here. Go to Deuteronomy 8.2. Listen what it says here. Deuteronomy 8.2. Just one text so we get in our mind and understand that we're all going to be tested. All of us. You got verse 2? And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to one humble you and to, to test you to know what was in your heart. There it is. Now, you, you're, you know, it fits perfectly with uh, Second Chronicles, but you still might be scratching your head and wondering. Let me tell you something, folks. The wilderness wandering of 40 years is an illustration of what we're going through now because we are headed towards the borders of the promised land and that's exactly what they were doing during the 40 years and in the process he tested them so that they would know who they really were and what they were really like and when they got there they weren't fit to go in folks there's no turning back and wandering around some more and then trying it another time. That's already been done. This is our last chance. We're all going to be tested. Are you ready for that test? 
Are you clinging to God? Do you know prophecy? You know, we hold a prophecy seminar here. Few of you come. We're going through the book of Ezekiel at prayer meeting. Few of you come. We have a prayer session. Skip lunch and pray Sabbath. Few of you come. Now, I know family things come up. I understand. But let me tell you what my fear is. My fear is because I love you, I wonder, are you just plain lazy? I wonder, are you lackadaisical? I wonder, do you really not understand how close we are to the end? That it calls for extreme measures. we got to step out of our comfort zone, and that means stretch ourselves farther than we normally do. Why? These are special circumstances now. They're no longer business as usual. No longer. And I'm not complaining. I want you to know, I'm going to keep being here. If I didn't love you, I wouldn't say this. Why? Because I wouldn't care if you came or not. But I do care. And I worry, because it could be one of the negative things that goes through my mind. And maybe it isn't. Maybe you're perfectly all right. And I hope so. But I want you to know we're all going to be tested. Are you ready for that test? Because I'll tell you, it's coming fast and it's coming hard to all of us. Notice this. Here's what Prophets and Kings says. 348. The story of King Hezekiah's failure is fraught with an important lesson for all. Here it is. Far more than we do, we need to speak of the precious chapters in our experience of the mercy and loving kindness of God. Of the matchless depths of the Savior's love. And how can we do that unless we are desperately in love with Jesus and have a personal relationship with him? It's impossible. And folks, you can't wait till the last minute. We can't wait till the last minute. We have to do it when it's easy to do it because when it's hard to do it, it'll be questionable whether we can. Number two, don't miss your cue. Don't miss your cue. Did Hezekiah miss his cue? Yeah, he did. He missed his cue. In fact, look at this though. Second Chronicles 32, 24. I hope you're still in 2 Chronicles. Kept your finger there. 2 Chronicles 23, 24, 25. Here's some additional information that isn't in 2 Kings, isn't in Isaiah, but it's in Chronicles. Here's what it says. In those days, Hezekiah was sick and near death, and he prayed to the Lord and spoke to him and gave him a sign. But Hezekiah did not reply according to the favor shown him, for his heart was lifted up. Therefore, wrath was looming over him and over Judah. There it is. There it is. You know, when I flashed that incredible slide on the screen of the 22 kings of Judah, only four were good. I want you to know how dangerous it is to be prosperous. I want you to know how dangerous it is to be famous, to be important. Because it corrupts. And unless you cling to God, like Isaiah did cling to God, you won't get through this. And by the way, the good news is, did Hezekiah get through this? Did he? Yes, he did. And we're going to see in the last point of the whole sermon, especially in count of the fact that God is so merciful. But also because he had practiced humbling himself prior to this situation, he was ready for the crisis even after he missed his cue. Don't miss your cue. Those with whom we associate day by day need our what? And our guidance. They may be in such a condition of mind 
that a word spoken in season will be as a nail in a sure place. Folks, when I read this, my heart aches to be a better person. Imagine that you could be so close to God that something you said would just change the day for a person who wasn't having a good day, would be encouragement to someone who was hurting. Tomorrow, some of these souls may be where we can never reach them again. How is it with you at work? How is it with you at home? How is it with you in your neighborhood? Because we are surrounded by people that if we were on our toes spiritually, they would be blessed by our presence. Isn't that unbelievable? Like you come into a room and bring joy. Jenny says she's got six sisters, and one of them she really likes. Why? Because Martha makes her laugh. And she's always smiling. And she's always happy. And she makes you happy. So when she comes in the room, things are changed. That's what it's talking about here. I want to be that way, don't you? But see, we can't be that way unless we spend time with Jesus Christ. Number three, we must humble ourselves. We must humble ourselves. Go back to Second Chronicles. We did 24, 25. Now look at verse 26. In fact, let me, let me read 25 with 26 so you get the whole picture here. 25, but Hezekiah did not repay according to the favor shown him, for his heart was lifted up. Therefore, wrath was looming over him and over Judah and Jerusalem. Do you realize that their behavior could have caused Shennacherib, uh, king of Assyria, to actually overthrow? To overthrow Jerusalem. But 26, then Hezekiah humbled himself for the pride of his heart, he and the inhabitants of Judah, Jerusalem, so that the wrath of the Lord did not come upon them in the days of Hezekiah. We've got to humble ourselves, folks. You know, we can talk about that, but it is not easy to do. You know, I still struggle, and this church... This church doesn't have the problem as serious as other churches I've been at. And that is that if someone in the church crosses you, forget humility, forget Christianity, take care of that in a human fashion, and then go back to your Christianity. That has to stop. And I applaud this church. Because for the most part, you don't suffer from that. But it's devastating. Churches, one of Satan's most successful techniques is to split the church. And by the way, if that's what Satan's up to, then what does Jesus want? Unity, even at your personal expense where you swallow your pride, let it slide, and get back to reaching people for Jesus and preserving the family relationship even when one of the family members doesn't deserve it. Doesn't deserve it. And it could be the pastor. It could be me. And I made my mistakes, and I'm sorry for them, and I'm embarrassed by them because you can see that my desire is not to be that way. We must humble ourselves. During his remaining years, his faith was to be severely tested, and he was to learn that only by putting his trust fully in Jehovah could he hope to triumph over the power 
of the powers of darkness that were plotting his ruin and utter destruction of his people. You know, I, I, it, it, this fits, and you'll accept this. This fits. Why do you think we come here at 5 o'clock on Sabbath morning to pray for all of you? Because the powers of darkness are plotting our ruin and our utter destruction. And so we have to be here praying before church. We want the decks cleared from Satan and his evil spirits. We want all our hearts touched before we walk through the door so that we can be a hospital for sinners instead of act like a saint's or rest home for saints. So we pray at five in the morning because we became aware that the powers of darkness were plotting our ruin and your ruin and our destruction and your destruction. So we come and we pray. We must humble ourselves. And the last one, number four, I couldn't stop the sermon without mentioning this. This is the most logical, right? God is very merciful. He is very merciful. I mean, Hezekiah, he just healed Hezekiah from death, said, I give you 15 more years. And Hezekiah then turns around and shows all the goodies to the Babylonians and doesn't talk about his great God. Doesn't talk about his great God. Lamentations 3.2. Lamentations 3.2. You know, Lamentations is right after Jeremiah. You all know this. This is what the text that great is thy faithfulness is based on. Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord our fathers. Lamentations 3.22, look what it says. Though through, through the Lord's mercies we are not, we are not consumed because his compassion never fails. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says the soul. Therefore, I hope in him. And so, friends, I want you to know that in this, days and, this day and age in which we're living, it is time. There's no more time, I should say, but it certainly is time that first and foremost, we need to recognize that we're all going to be tested. We, sh we can't afford to miss our cue. We must humble ourselves and rely on the fact that God is merciful. You're aware, I thought I deleted that. You're aware of the parable that Jesus tells in the book, only the book of Luke. He says there was a tree in the garden and uh, the vineyard, or the, the carer of the trees went there and it didn't bear fruit. And the master came and says, what's up with this tree? He said, well, it didn't bear fruit. And the master said, cut it down. And the son said to the master, give me one more year. Let me put fertilizer and additional water and let's see if it will bear fruit finally. And do you know what happened in that parable? Do you? If you do, you know more than I do because the parable stops there. But one more year is all that tree had left for its existence. It's now time, folks, to bear fruit. It's now time for us to get so close to Jesus we can't help but bear fruit. We can't help but support and love one another. We can't help but be kind to one another, and even those who aren't kind to us. Why? Because that's what Jesus would do if he was here, and the time is now short. We can't be waiting to do our part, which is his part.
And so I'm, I want to tell the baptismal candidates, when we are singing the closing hymn, I want you to come up front with your wet hair so that when service is over, all the people can come by and shake your hand and welcome you into membership. And we can start today practicing being a family at every opportunity that we have to show our love and support for one another. Father, I want to thank you for the challenge of this hour. And I want to pray that you would help us to be ready for the test that's coming. And also, Lord, that we would not miss our cue and that we would be willing to humble ourselves because we would see how Jesus humbled himself and rely on your mercy, which is new every morning. So bless each person in this auditorium, in this sanctuary today, Lord, so that they will know how special they are. For you would not come up with sermons like these that plead for our soul if you didn't want us to be with you for eternity in heaven. And thank you that you're that kind of God. Help us to say yes to you, we pray in Jesus' name.